This week we see another massive drop of updates from Garmin for the Edge 530, the Edge 830, and the Edge 1030, which I'll refer all to as the Garmin X30 series. Garmin are now on version five of the firmware for the 530 and the 830, and 9.0 on the 1030. And we're seeing a consolidation here of the X30 series. And what I mean by that is the code base that seems to be merging together into almost one, because every time we see a bug fix or a change log out for one, it's blindly across all three identically. There were a few changes here and there, very similar across all three though. And today is definitely no exception. Jumping here to the change log for the 530, and I'll quickly switch to the 830 and the 1030, back to the 830 and then back to the 530. They're all pretty much the same. There are a few little things that have changed and I will pick those out in a minute, but we'll go top to bottom of most of these and have a look at the important changes I think that are interesting. Kicking off our run through today with Connect IQ 3.1 across the board on all three. Connect IQ is Garmin's app store effectively, or ability for people to develop their own apps and things as widgets and screens and across all these units here. And the full details of Connect IQ 3.1, I'll put links below, um, but gives the ability for developers to connect uh, Ant Plus, Wi-Fi or BLE and within their apps, which opens up, as it says here, entirely new use cases for connecting your apps to the outside world. Very powerful stuff. If you've got widgets or connections or apps on here that can connect via Wi-Fi, Bluetooth to the outside world, pull in more data to give you more info out in the road or indoors, that's pretty cool. I don't think we've seen that very much tapped yet. We'll see soon though, I guess, as this is now rolling out across all three devices. Next up on the list across all three is the ability to control Garmin InReach remotely. DC Ramica spoke about this on our podcast this week. Again, links below. Uh, InReach is Garmin's GPS unit. So if you're out of cell service, you can use this GPS unit or one of these GPS units to send messages, locations, tracking, etc. cetera. Uh, there is an associated cost with doing that. Uh, if you need it, I guess you're gonna be looking into it. Again, links below, but now compatible across all of these three X30 units. Now, third on the list and one close to my heart is improvements to indoor cycling user experience. And I've tested this today. I'll go into it at the last part of the video. It was pretty cool. So they've got here improved smart trainer discovery and initial setup experience when using an indoor activity profile. Now, why they've updated this is that indoor trainers, FEC controlled trainers, which these units will control themselves, doesn't pair like a standard sensor. So you can't just add sensor smart trainer and go. It's added under the training and you add a trainer profile. It was a bit clumsy to do. This morning, I started up the 8.30, it found the kicker bike, paired it, stepped me through it, job done. It was really, really simple. So the onboarding was pretty cool. The other improvement to the indoor cycling experience is improved follow course experience by enabling UI. So for the UI, the user interface on these units will show you the virtual map. You will get Climb Pro indoors, which I think it's better suited for indoors. We'll go into it later on, it was pretty cool. You get elevation and all the data as if you are riding out on the road and I did test that today with the kicker bike. Again, later in the video, I'll go through it. It worked pretty well. Next up, made improvements to the workout user experience if you're using workouts out on the road or indoors, some improvements there. Next up on the list here, improvements to the Climb Pro user experience. Again, that'll be indoors and outdoors now because it supports both. And adding a setting in Climb Pro data screen to specify which climbs should be detected. All climbs, medium or large or large only climbs. The way Climb Pro detects climbs is a whole mathematical formula. Again, I'll link below to that. Best off just test it out on your next ride if you've got a navigatable course or indoors on a course to see what it's all about. There's nothing like some hands-on to figure out how it actually works. Made improvements to the segment user experience and a few things there. Fixed an issue with pairing to the iPhone 11. Yes, a pain point of pairing these to phones can be a little troublesome. So if you had issues there with the iPhone 11, they are working on that, that's a good thing. Another one I think is quite important, added pressure filter in order to improve elevation recording. Another pain point between users and Garmin, or users and other users, if you're riding with a mate, your mate's got this, your wife's got this, whoever, you do the same ride and come back with different elevation data. Elevation can be influenced by many things, typically air pressure, that's how it works. But if your Garmin is mounted on the front of your bike versus your stem, maybe even in your back pocket, they can record a little differently for many reasons. However, it looks like they've worked a little bit on that to smooth things out to make sure your elevation data is a little smoother, possibly more accurate, time will tell. The devil is in the details with these updates and there's another pain point here which I've seen some people comment on. Now, fix an issue where activities could report inaccurate distances if GPS was acquired after the activity started. I think we've all done that. We've put on one shoe, half the other shoe, half a sock, one arm warmer to make that group ride. We've turned our unit on and just hit start because we don't want to miss anything. It hasn't got satellite sync just yet 
and things can balk out a little bit. Again, more updates for that if you're one who likes to run late to group rides. Next up is one I did kind of refer to earlier on, improved first beat heat acclimation by utilizing weather forecasts. Again, the devil's in the details here. So heat acclimation, where it'll tell you how you're acclimatizing to different heat temperatures and things. Are you 100% acclimatized? How, how long have you been in that new temperature range? If it's pulling in data from elsewhere, utilizing these weather forecasts, it's gonna have more data to give you more accurate information. And I guess give you better estimates and better data into your head unit so you can train better. I guess that's the theory. What I'm fascinated with though is it's using data from external sources. That's pretty cool. Uh, next up on the list here, ability to render Hebrew text for incoming smart notifications, cool more language support, fix issues with the map zoom level not being set correctly, cool just general user experience things there. Fix an issue where battery save mode could stop working mid ride. Yeah, that'd be kind of awkward if you were in battery save mode and that stopped and everything went flat because if it's not recorded, if it's not on Strava, it never happened. Added jump prompts for each jump in cases where there are multiple jumps in a row. Uh, any hardcore mountain bikers, if you can tell me how that goes, if you've got multiple jumps in a row and it wants you wants to give you a jump prompt after the first jump, I'd be off on the second jump. My face would be in the dirt. So not sure what that's about. Again, one for the mountain bikers with these units with accelerometers in them. Fix issues with heart rate graph field. Cool, fix an issue with auto detect max heart rate. Okay, another fixes. Improved Y scaling on the elevation profile. Yeah, I've always got problems with the elevation profiles on these units. It looks like you're riding to the moon and back every time you ride, say a 10K ride, and there's a few little elevation things in there. So hopefully some fixes there for that. Next up, fixed cosmetic issues with extended display mode. Uh, extended display mode allows users of watches such as the, I've got the 945 on now. If I wanted to record everything with this and just have these in display mode, Obviously, it fixes an issue with that somehow, cosmetic one, as listed here. Added additional info to nutrition and hydration settings page. I've not dived into that. They're just nag screens at the end of my ride. I don't track, I'm, I, I wouldn't say complete old school, but having the unit track what I drink, not yet. If there's a sensor in my water bottle, I'd be happier with that. Uh, turned backlight on when user laps or there's an auto lap during an activity. Cool, I agree with that. If you're out riding, doing circuits, or you're doing intervals and there's auto lapping happening, it's an event, it's an activity you wanna look down and see what's on the screen. If it's gonna turn the backlight on, clearer to see the screen, happy days, I agree with that one. Second last on the list here, automatically size the text in the elevation data field. There's more and more information being shown on the elevation screen, so just moving text around, I guess, for a better user experience, UI experience. And finally, improved overall device stability by fixing crashes and freezes. The generic catch-all of, we've just fixed a lot of shit and it's now all okay for what we've fixed, but we're not gonna list it all. There could be a hundred fixes under there. So that's the 5.30, that's everything top to bottom. Uh, in the 8.30, the difference there is in the 8.30, they have added directional arrows for round trip courses. That was the only thing I could find different between the 5.30 and the 8.30. And over on the 10.30, the only difference I could find there was there was no uh, elevation filtering or the altimeter filtering we saw for the uh, altimeter stuff. So probably a different chipset in that one, but that's the only difference. So a massive list of updates and fixes across all three units, definitely worth doing if you own any of these. And somebody did mention they upgraded the version nine on the 1030 and said, well, I updated and turned it on and big deal, no difference. Yeah, a lot of it's behind the scenes, especially with the fixes. And those additions are kind of use edge cases, depending if you're using those functions or not. They're the kind of things that you just accept should work. And the fixes are always a good thing. So definitely do your updates. Okay, here we are in the Llama Lab pairing the 830 to the kicker as a controllable trainer, the kicker bike. It finds that straight away. We hit add and we're done. That's as simple as that. It'll pull up as a sensor now and we can choose any of the options here. What I'm after is follow a course. Uh, there's no courses on the head unit. So I can hit create new, create from history. Let's go last Thursday's ride. I'll just call it course 00, that's fine. Boom, course created. We have a look at the details of that. Into summary, two hours, 52 and a half kilometers. There's all my stats from the ride the other day. It's just a pretty easy ride with a mate. Looking at the map, that's the map, which included a pump track. I will have to dodge that one for this ride. We might test that another day. Elevation wise, there's the spikes. We'll do the first 45 minutes indoors. And there's the climb pro data. So it's picked out three climbs from the ride. Two and the third climb, which goes up past the camels. There are real camels. 
and that Climb Pro information will come up indoors as I ride. So that's pretty cool. Settings wise, there's a few things we can have a look at there. I think I'll just go with defaults for all that though today. And we hit ride. Away we go. Let's scroll out, scroll out, and it's ready to ride. That's rewriting the course. Now you can create a course from history or from online if you wanted to export one. Okay, a bit of camera shake here as I'm going through town. And you can see the map there in real time and the elevation graph in real time. And I'm switching over to stills to make it a little easier on the eye here. So there's the first climb pro climb kicking in. You can see how far to go, the gradient that I'm on, the simulated gradient and the simulated elevation. And once the climb pro is done, it'll go back to normal mode. You can see there flying down into Creswick with a grade of 3%. And the kicker bike was tilting as expected which is fantastic. Having a look at the recorded data from the inside ride versus the outside ride, and here are the two rides. Here is the outside ride, here's the inside ride. Outside, inside, outside, inside, outside. And you can see the speed graph there is almost the same for the simulated ride. That was pretty cool. That was out to Creswick from here. Over on Strava, the ride uploads as a virtual ride. And I've put here uh, Garmin Edge with Kicker Bike Course Follow Simulation. You can see the map is overlaid there. It's not going to get any comms because it's marked as a virtual ride. And on Strava, virtual rides and e-bike rides don't take into account any KOMs or segments. If we scroll down there, there's the gradient. There's me following the ride along. All looks pretty good. We can go to analysis and see we've got power, heart rate, cadence, temperature. Temperature is indoors, obviously, and not simulated. But that all looks pretty cool. Definitely felt in my mind like I was riding out the Creswick. That was the gradient experience. The immersion though really wasn't there because it was only on this thing following a top-down map. I wasn't going past the trees and the camels and the llamas and the sheep and everything that I do go past outside. But it's a case of if I missed a bunch ride and they were doing the Creswick loop, I could load this up and do it, get the same training effect. Yes, I'm inside, I know. But it, again, if I own this and I own the bike or the smart train, it's free to load that up and follow it along. And the fact that I could download my ride from the other day into the exact same ride, and it was seamless. That's the key, I forgot. It was seamless. It just goddamn worked, as it should. But I'm pretty happy that things now just work. Okay, so wrapping this one up for today, and I'm super happy that that indoor experience just worked. There were two different companies. It was Garmin. It was Wahoo. Using App Plus FEC, an industry standard, interacting together and just working. And with the tilt as well. Things as they should. This is brilliant. This is what we should be seeing. I'm hoping what we're seeing now with the higher cadence from Garmin, with all these updates across the board and the unification of these code bases, kind of, that they're just bringing themselves up to a new level, a new standard of Garmin, which we won't go back to the old days. I've been through them all. The crashes, the invalid fit files, the unpairing, the deep. there's a lot of fixes taking place. I'm just hoping they're raising their own bar and their own standards internally, in which what we're seeing as consumers coming out in these devices. It should be smooth sailing from here on in. I'm keen to see where they go in the future with newer units. This old beast is due for an update and due to get rid of the bezels, according to the community. Anyway, we'll leave it there for today. Sunday afternoon, do your updates. Have a good weekend.